I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. Today on The James Altucher Show. Man, that was a good interview. I'm doing the intro after the interview. Jeff Immelt was CEO of GE. Maybe not the world's biggest company anymore, but it was, and probably the world's most complicated company. They have divisions. I mean, they have 300,000 employees and probably a billion customers use their stuff or more. The entire world uses something made by GE. Jeff Immelt was CEO for 16 years, and he just learned an enormous amount. And he's very humble in his book, and he was very humble on the podcast. And finally, I asked the critical question, like, what advice would you give to someone who, how do you judge success? How do you judge if someone can be successful or if someone wants to be more successful, what should they do? And he gave me very good, a very good answer, but I won't take the words out of his mouth. Here's former CEO of GE and author of Hot Seat, which is an excellent book. It was like a master class of being a CEO. So here we go. Here's Jeff. Now, the Finger Lakes is beautiful. I, I didn't enjoy college, but I enjoyed living in the Finger Lakes. Whereas Jeff had a blast at Harvard MBA. No, you know, that's not true, James. I, I enjoyed my undergrad, but I, I didn't really like business school that much. And this is actually a good place to start. Like, how would you compare business school to reality of being like, you got an MBA at the top business school in the world, and then you were CEO of the most complicated company in the world, I can safely argue, General Electric. What didn't you learn that you wish you had learned? Oh, gosh. You know what's so funny, James? Like the courses that I thought were complete BS were organizational behavior. You know, it was like I loved finance and marketing and manufacturing and things like that. But all this stuff about people I thought was kind of boring. And then, you know, when I became CEO, that's like all I all I worked on was organizational behavior and people and all that stuff. So. I probably should have paid more attention when I was in school. Like how, what percentage of your time as CEO of GE, like if you take all your conversations with business associates or even like family, but you're talking business, what percentage of conversations were about the psychology of the people around you or your customers or your vendors versus, okay, now we have to make this new product or business plan or whatever. A like, lot. I'd say a third, you know, I'd say, I'd say I spent a third of my time 
talking to people, thinking about people, strategizing around people. Uh, yeah, no, a third. I probably spent a third there, a third, maybe 30%, 30% on problems, just problems. 30% on, on growth, you know, deals and stuff like that. And maybe 10% on governance. So I'd say 30, 30, 30, 10. That's interesting. Like when you're talking about people, what would be the average conversation? Like, would it be given this person's psychology, how can we persuade them? How can we motivate them? What would be that kind of conversation you would have about people? You know, it ranges, Gene. So for like eight years, monthly, I would bring one executive to my house on a Friday night with their spouse. And then they would spend uh, five or six hours on a Saturday morning, just the two of us. I'm going to write that down. One executive Friday night. And they, they would stay over? They would stay over. So we would, they would stay at a hotel typically. We would have dinner and then they, we would spend the next morning, probably five hours in my office. And I really wanted to kind of say, okay, now, like, tell me about you. Like, like, how are you doing? What do you want to do? How do you assess yourself? Here's how I see you. Talk about your business, you know, uh, and then tell me something I don't know about the company. What would you change? What would you do differently? So go from like really intense one-on-one -on -one conversations all the way to thinking about like, what's the right comp plan? Who should we put in a job, take out of a job? You know, kind of all the structural stuff around people. And, and it would kind of range everywhere in between. And, and like, let's say, let's say they would say to you, you know, I love everything about my division. There's this one guy I elevated to senior vice president. He's not that good. I'm not sure what to do. What advice would you give? Yeah, look, I would talk him through it. I'd say, uh, has he lost his confidence? What is it that you don't like about them? He, 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 let's say he's just bad. He, he, he's been in this position 18 months. His division has gone down and I get the sense he's, um, people are quitting because of him. Yeah. I'd say that's, I wouldn't wait any longer than Monday. I let, let's, uh, let's go, who do you want to put in the job and let me figure out a way to help you remove that person. Right. So I'd be very direct on those kinds of things. And frequently the discussions would be there, but sometimes they'd say, look, this person hasn't performed, but they haven't lost their confidence. I think they can do it. And that would tend to be more frequently uh, the conversations we'd have. So uh, I just want to start off by saying, so Jeff Ilmelt, the former CEO of General Electric, one of the most famous CEOs of the past 20 years. And I say famous, not in a Kim Kardashian way, although nothing wrong with that. But I say famous in the sense that every time I turned on CNBC, there was you in one situation or other. General Electric over years has had its hands in every single industry possible on the planet. You were the CEO of that. General Electric is the only company of the original Dow Jones index that still exists. I'm sure you knew that, Jeff. <laughs> And uh, the, he's the author of the book, Hot Seat, What I Learned Leading a Great American Company, Jeff Immelt, former CEO of GE. And Jeff, I could tell right away, you're real, you, you say you didn't study organizational behavior, but as soon as I got on the Zoom, I felt like, does he know me? Do I know him already? Like, you're so good at like establishing a bond right away with people. It's amazing. So, I mean, Jay was already talking about his family life in Malaysia to you and you, you, you got it going. So, so let's start from the beginning of your term at GE. You started four days. After, so, so I started, uh, so my first real day was September 10th of 2001. So the day before September 11th. And I, I did kind of an all employee uh, uh, kind of webcast with Sue Herrera. Uh, and, you know, I was feeling good about life and I flew to Seattle in the afternoon to see Boeing and I woke up the next morning and the world changed. You know, I, I was, uh, I was on a stair stepper in the fitness room when the second plane hit the world trade center. And so, you know, at that moment we insured the buildings, uh, we owned 1200 aircraft and had 50% of the world's, uh, jet engines. NBC, you know, decided to go uh, commercial free for four or five days. So I kind of like tripped right into a crisis for the world, but also a crisis for the company. So that was my, that was my honeymoon. That's unbelievable. And, and again, not only were so many of your divisions related to, was immediately affected by 
but you know, of course, many of your employees might have uh, been affected and and so on. What was your your priorities that day? What did you do, and and what do you think you did that was bad, and what do you think you did that was successful? Yeah, I would say the first thing was safety of people. So it took probably till the end of that day to figure out, you know, kind of what what was the scope of the crisis. And did we have people that were impacted? We actually had two people that died. So that was probably the first day. And then we started kind of combing through the businesses in terms of who would be impacted, what what the scope of the impact might be. Uh, I think on Wednesday of that week, I reached out to Rudy Giuliani and said uh, we would donate $10 million to the families of the the police and fire uh, firefighters. And so really, James, it was just kind of like day by day, a TikTok of what kind of exposure did we have? What, what, uh, where were we fine? Where were, where were we going to struggle? And, and kind of went through that week. Uh, on Friday, we made a decision to write off somewhere between one and $2 billion on the insurance on the World Trade Center. And then we just got ready for the market to open the following Monday. So it was... Uh, it was a scramble. You know, the airlines were tremendously impacted. So as you went into kind of the second and third week, we were kind of going around the airline industry and trying to decide whether or not to lend the money, what kind of exposure we had, who was going to be in the worst shape. And we made a bunch of decisions around the airlines. And uh, I'd say it probably took a month to really get through, you know, kind of what the total scope of the of the businesses would be. Let's see, what did I do best? We invested in airlines. We we basically shored up our aviation business. And that turned out to be a fantastic move because somehow, some way they made it through the crisis and we, we generated a tremendous return on our investment uh, that we made there. What would I have done differently? This is really only kind of been looking back over a long period of time. I wish I'd spent time right after the crisis, maybe 60 days later, and basically kind of slowed down the earnings of the company, uh, changed a little bit of the strategic context of the company. Because I think after every crisis, you get a chance to reset yourself. And I didn't take that opportunity. We'll talk later about what you may have done during something like the pandemic and you know how it affected business. But I wanna keep going towards the topics in the book and, and work, work through that. So you start at GE, you, you, it starts off with a major crisis. You say you wish you had, uh, you know, slowed down earnings a little bit, but I feel like with GE, GE had for, for as for Jack Welch's entire career, he had done, had this uncanny ability to keep earnings steadily growing at a, a steady percentage above the stock market, which was a, a benefit to the stock. I feel like Wall Street analysts have a, a narrative about each company, and that was GE's narrative that you always had to fulfill. Were you? Did you feel hampered by that? Did you have to? Did you feel like right away? Did you have to do things to keep improving the stock? Yeah, you know, not not the stock per se, James, but you know what I what I had was, you know, I had spent probably eight or nine months studying the company after it had been named before Jack left. Basically, knew that our industrial businesses weren't that strong; that they had basically. Uh, had underinvested in those businesses. And what had really grown in the 90s is financial services. So right. we were sitting there at 50-50 in, uh, industrial financial, and we had a price earnings ratio of 50. So we traded like a tech stock. And some, you know, kind of the decision I made was to let G Capital continue to grow, use that cash to improve the industrial businesses, and keep the EPS, let's say, more or less chugging along with the S&P 500. And that worked until the financial crisis. And then it didn't look that smart, right? So I think the challenge I had was that investors really didn't underwrite the company. The only thing they looked at was kind of dividend and earnings per share and things like that. And it was going to take me a while to break them into a different way to a different narrative, let's say, around the company. That's what I thought. Now, you know, again, when I look back with the benefit of hindsight, I probably would have changed that up sooner. Yeah. What, what would you, how would you have done that? How would you have educated Wall Street to um, say, hey, this is Jeff Immelt's company. We're going to do something a little bit different. I would have gone through kind of what I just said to you. I would have said, look, we've, we've got some major reinvestments we need to do industrially, which we're going to do. And, and while we go through that time period, three or four or five years, the earnings per share is going to be less than the S&P 500. 
probably. So, so let's say when you said that, and this was probably, maybe you even did consider this and you were afraid the stock was going to fall 20% the next day, which it could have, you know, depending on what year it was and the volatility of that year. Uh, let's say you had said that and the stock fall, uh, fell 20% the next day. Do you think people would have called for your head? Like, this is not what Jack Welch would have done. I don't know. You know, I like, like, you know, we, we, we chewed on it. We thought about it. I, I again, I, I thought we could kind of keep growing and make the changes we need to make while the car was running. And like I said, James, that worked uh, through 2007. Uh, you know, it, what, what happened though, was that we made financial services probably bigger than it should have been. And that didn't look that smart when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. So yeah. Again, hindsight's always twenty twenty. I, I hate to blame investors for for it because I think I think we we you know we were executing a strategy that was actually working, but it ended up with a with a finance company, a, a wholesale debt funded finance company that was just way too big. No, and I think that was the the criticism of G around the time of the financial crisis, or even after Jack Welch, when it was suspected that because of the huge impact of the financial operations on G's bottom line it was easier to smooth out earnings was, was the general criticism. No one knows if that's true or not. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I like the narrative also of GE, which, which, which I think you kept going, which is be in every industry or every sector where you could buy the top one or two companies, be in as many sectors as possible to diversify and apply best practices with Six Sigma. And I feel like a lot of the chapters in your book sort of are you playing out those narratives. You know, again, there was in the 90s, there was always this or 80s, there was always this impression that GE was in every sector, particularly every industrial sector, and would buy the top one or two companies in that sector. Do you think that carried through in your term? I mean, I believe it did. I think we narrowed, you know, we narrowed the company appreciably. I, I think what we tried to get around was really high tech infrastructure businesses that had kind of big aftermarket opportunities, were global and where you could build technical scale. We were in aviation, we were in healthcare, we were in uh, uh, transportation, energy, oil and gas, things like that. And in all those businesses, we had leadership market positions. We had kind of a common global footprint. We had strong technology, really, really technical scale versus our competitors. And so we, we slowly got out of businesses like plastics or NBC or businesses that didn't fit that model. Right. And I think, you know, I think James, like, um, you know, it's it's easy to run a conglomerate when things are pretty good. It's tough. It's tougher to run a conglomerate in the face of volatility when, when um, you know, you have a nine eleven or financial crisis or or uh, Fukushima or even COVID. You find it to be a little bit more difficult when you have one or two businesses that are really impacted in a big way, beyond just typical recessionary forces. In what way? Like, let's take, uh, let's take the, um, take the financial crisis, the financial crisis. I had kind of half the company that was in like a death spiral. And at the same time, we're trying to reinvest in aviation, build the right lineup for NBC, uh, get the next generation of healthcare products in the marketplace, things like that. And I'd say, and doing it with a common balance sheet and a common board, uh, really a common management team at the top with that kind of volatility it's hard to just compartmentalize the businesses that are going through a real struggle and protect the ones that are uh, capable of growth, right? So, so simpler in an environment like we're in right now is just better. Yeah, I mean, um, an envir it's, a, it's interesting to say an environment like we're in now because we're still dealing with the after effects of the economic lockdowns, but we'll get to that. What I wanna say about this book is that it's almost like a guidebook for how one should be CEO of not only like the biggest company in the world, potentially, but even a small company, like it's dealing with people, it's dealing with problems, it's taking ownership of your decisions. It's knowing when to buy, when to sell, when to hire, when to fire. You know, in the middle of the book, you talk about, you were considering buying Westinghouse Electric, which very much fit in with what you just described as businesses you wanted to be in. And it was, they set up nuclear reactors. And one of the board members, Roger, um, Roger Pence, he said uh, he hates this business it's all risk and no reward. But just on the surface, it seems like buying a company that makes nuclear reactors when the U.S. is always on the verge, it seems, of going all in on nuclear reactors, just like many other countries have. Why did you take his advice other than, yeah, let's just take good advice? 
Well, he was, a, he, first of all, he, he, he was one of those directors that just really had great judgment. He was a good listener. He, he knew a lot about a, a lot of different things. So he had that kind of stature in the company. But I think what he was reflecting on was in, in a business like nuclear, you just don't control enough of your own destiny, right? It's any government can stop you at any moment in time. And if you look back in those days, you know, there was going to be another nuclear renaissance that lasted for about 18 months mm. and then it just went kaput. So in this case, he was right, right, in terms of the in terms of the insect. So from a power generator, you know, we were already in the business, we're in the power business, you know, on, on a number of different levels, it made sense. But when you looked under the covers with respect to just the additional risk that it entailed, uh, he probably was exactly right. And, and you know, th those are the times when directors make a huge difference. Yeah, that's interesting because I sort of feel like most, like you see company X buys company Y, and then two years later, it writes down the entire value of company Y. I feel like most acquisitions should never happen, but you guys have made, I mean, GE is known for, for making and assimilating good acquisitions. You know, I, I think acquisitions, you've got to be thinking about three things. You, you got to be thinking about, does the market really fit and the product in the market, does that really work? You got to be thinking about timing. Where are you in industry cycles and how much you're paying? And you got to have a team that's ready to execute, right? And, and if you have two out of those three, three things, and it's hard to get all three right, right? When you get all three right, you're going to do well. You're going to hit a home run. If you get two out of three right, you're going to basically return your cost of capital. But if you get two out of three wrong, uh, you're going to write something down. And if you get three out of three wrong, you're going to write the whole thing down. And I think people aren't honest enough about those three things. Is there really a fit right with the company? Where are you in the market cycle and what are you paying? And is your team really ready for doing that kind of acquisitive work? We, we acquired a bioprocess manufacturing company called Amersham in the early 2000s. Uh, the market was better than we thought. The timing was perfect. And the team was not so good in the beginning, but over time became really good. And that was an absolute home run, right? We bought oil and gas assets. The market was good, fit was good. The timing was terrible, but the team was great, right? Those were barely okay, just barely okay. But you know, there's other times when you just get all three wrong and that's when it's, uh, that's when it's a mess. And it's hard to predict. It's hard to predict, right? We did all these insurance deals in the late 90s. We ran them poorly. Uh, it was a horrible timing. It was an industry we had no business in. And that's cost the company tens of billions of dollars over time, right? So it's... Why, why would you say? Because in, insurance in general is a great industry, right? Like people give you money every month and they hope they never see that money again because otherwise it means some disaster happened. And meanwhile, while you're sitting on this money called the float, you get to invest it and make money on it. And no one wants to ever have that money back as opposed to a bank where it's the same business model, except everybody wants all their money back. Look, you just described Warren Buffett's, you just described Warren Buffett's franchise. But if you look at like yes. the general life insurance business over the last 20 years, right? Highly regulated, low return, interest rates have stunk for the last 20 years, right? It's just been a really tough uh, business model. In our case, we just never had the right team. We never had the right headset. You know, you, you can't think about quarterly earnings when you're in the insurance business. You have to take a really long view. And let's face it, not everybody's Warren Buffett when it comes to investing. So it's kind of like when I read his annual report, I say, gosh, he makes it sound so easy, you know, but, but uh, other people have struggled and we sure did. You could have just called Warren Buffett and say, hey, what, what are you guys doing? Can I just follow what you do? What well, you know, I used to go see Warren. I used to take my shareholder letter every year and I'd fly to Omaha and sit with Warren. Really, we talked about insurance. We just ran it poorly, James, you know, but we had other businesses we did with him. So, you know, we would talk about other things as well, but he was always very gracious with his time. I want to reel back to the beginning. Like Jack Welch had this not unusual way of picking potential CEOs, but there's certain strategies when picking who a successor would be. And he took an extreme view, which is let's identify publicly or semi-publicly the three candidates I, I'm looking at or four candidates and kind of make them compete against each other. And I, maybe that's not a, a too simple a summary, but when you knew you were up for consideration for CEO and you knew who the other 
candidates were. How did it make you feel? Oh, I hated it. You know, James, I, I, I hated the, um, I thought the process was just a little weird. You know, it was too public. It went on for too long. You have to kind of put yourself back in time, you know, in, in that era, 99 and 2000, he was like the most famous business person in, in the world, maybe yeah. in the history of the world. And, and so he was a very, you know, distinguished and well-known guy, but, you know, it was, it was just awfully public. It went on for a long, uh, a long time. I was uncomfortable with it. Uh, he he brought us all in separately, let's say six months before he made the decision and, and basically told us that we would have to leave if we didn't get the job. So, you know, this was the only company I'd ever worked for and things like that. I, I thought I, I was like, I said, you're kidding. You know, that's you know, that's like that seems awfully severe to me. Why do but, you think people would have to leave? Because there would be just too much um, resentment. Yeah, you know, that was, you know, kind of the too much resentment, too much, you know, excess baggage and in terms of how people might feel. So, you know, that would, but, you know, it was kind of of the time, you know, to be honest with you, I always trusted him. So I never, I never complained about it or never thought twice about it because I thought at the end he would treat everybody the right way and things would be, things would work out. But, you know, nobody's ever copied that, you know, since then. So. I always think that, you know, if you really have a good idea, other people are going to do it as well. This is one where nobody else did it. So that's kind of the best it. And then, I mean, I've read articles about this. What made him ultimately decide on you versus the other very qualified candidates who ended up, ended up running CEOs of other multi hundred billion yeah. dollar companies? You know, I really, I, I never really asked him. I, I would say he thought about age for sure. And the other thing I would say, you know, James, I worked, I worked in my career in the plastics business and in the health and medical business. And most of the executives throughout the company were actually people that I had worked with before. So in addition to, you know, whatever I was doing or however well I was doing, I actually knew the most people of the three, even though I was younger, I had, I had spent more time in businesses where other executives were. And I think that, I think he valued that as well, right? In, in terms of peer relationships, uh, you know, cause let's face it, when, when a guy like that leaves, you know, everybody becomes a free agent. So, you know, part of the, uh, I'd say the, the struggle of taking over a, a, after a really famous guy is that everybody has a bond with him and he walks out the door. You have to replace those bonds as quickly as you can or build a new bench of people that, uh, that can come in and step up and do the job. Right. So, so, I mean, one approach might be sort of like what a, what a new King or emperor would do is just fire everybody and bring in your guys. So the loyalty is to you. Um, so you don't think people are conspiring behind your back, but you didn't really do that. You built bonds with the executives you had. Yeah. You no, know, we replaced a few people and changed the organization a little bit, you know, to, so that I, I could, feel it a little bit more in my own way in terms of what the right thing to do was, you know, for instance, the, the guy who ran G capital for a long time, was a great guy. I, I asked him to leave early on just because, you know, we're in this period after Enron where, you know, we just, we, we needed less opacity about G capital. So I made moves like that, but, you know, by the same token, there were people that, you know, I had never worked with before that we became, really strong friends and, and built really great relationships with. You know, and part of that is I feel like you travel a lot, like you do exploration travel a lot, meaning like you'll visit, you know, I, there was one part where you visited 27 cities in Asia and it was an exploratory mission to visit businesses there, see industry there. I feel like you, and, and you travel to, to see people. Um, you know, like you just said, you travel to Omaha just to discuss your shareholder letter with, with o o Warren Buffett, you wouldn't just pick up the phone and call them. What's why the travel? Cause it takes a lot of time to travel. It takes you away. Yeah, no, from no, it's a, it's a great, it's a great question. I would say that I, I was always kind of like a see it for myself kind of person that I thought that was the best way to make connections. And I, you know, I, I, I teach now business students, and I always tell them that, you know, the most important thing you can do is control your own calendar early on in a, in a career so that you can create the time and space you need or you want to learn, 
you know, to teach and to make connections. So I'd say throughout my career, I've always made the time to learn new things and to reach new people. The story you, you told right there, James, was in 1997, I think, and I was running the healthcare business. And I took the few weeks in August that I would normally take maybe for vacation and said to my wife, look, I'm going to go to China for two weeks and I'm going to go to 15 cities. I, I ended up going to 20 cities and I'm going to visit the hospitals and I'm going to write a business plan for China and healthcare. And I'm going to do that over my vacation. And did she and go with you? No. Oh, God, no, what she said. She was, she was not that displeased at all. She said, well, we'll miss you, but, you know, we're going to have fun anyhow. See ya. Yeah. Wouldn't so, want yeah, to be yeah. Uh, exactly. So uh, I, and, I just think times like that are always uh, critical and important. And 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 again, there's another point where you're having, uh, the, and the key word here is lunch. You're having lunch with Boeing CEO, and I like how, again, you mix. You take the vacation to go to uh, China and visit the cities. You take lunch to. You don't have a meeting with Boeing CEO. You have lunch yeah. with the CEO. So it's like all these big industries and businesses they're sort of your customers or vendors, or sometimes they're both. And sometimes they're competitors also. And it seems like at that level though, you're, you're all lodging such these entities that already are moving forward with just sheer inertia that you kind of just have to make sure the needle doesn't move too far away. And so it seems like you could all meet each other and help each other. And it's a, it's a, it's a win-win. Yeah. You know, the other thing I would say is the way to build relationships and relationships matter is you, you need to see people when you don't need them for anything, right? You, you need to make the time, whether it's a customer, an employee, or government person, you need to see that person when there's not a crisis, right? So I, I never joined a public board, but in the early 2000s, I joined the, the, the New York City, the New York Fed board with Tim Geithner. So I spent, you know, kind of like once a month with Tim, two hours a month for... I don't know, six years before the financial crisis. You know, so when the financial crisis hit, you know, like I had known Hank Paulson. I had known Tim Geithner. I had met Ben Bernanke. I, I, I had a 10-yard head start against every other financial services executive in the industry because I, I knew the people from, you know, they would return my call. They would, you know, they would, they would say, you know, they would tell me the truth. They would understand who we were and that's true with Boeing and that's true with other customers and people. So there's a real strength in knowing people out of sequence. When you don't need anything, you're, you're still paying them and calling them and seeing how they are. That, you know, uh, I should do more of that to be honest. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. -Z 
You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll sign up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply.
what was friendship for you during these 16 years you were CEO? Was it all like, did you have friends who had nothing to do with business and you would just go fishing with them and then t- and talk about the football game? Yeah, a, a very small circle, right? So I think if you're if you're going to be if you're going to have a complicated business life, you need a simple personal life. So when I wasn't at work, I was at home, and when I wasn't at home, I was at work. <laughs> you know, I didn't do golfing trips to Scotland or fishing trips to Montana, and I had a very small circle of um, let's say non GE friends, private friends. And then inside GE, you know, I had, I also had what I would call a small circle of people that had just been with me for a long time, who I trusted implicitly and uh, probably didn't make one big decision without, you know, picking their brain. So those are the ends of the spectrum. You know, for the benefit of the listeners, and I guess also for me, you explain Six Sigma in the book and GE has made, you know, so Six Sigma is this uh, model of how one should basically run a business at every level, but I never really understood what that is. Can you just give, can you just give a summary? So, you know, so like, like Six Sigma is really, um, it's, it's kind of a quality method for uh, defect reduction. So it really is meant to drive consistency in new product introduction, consistency in financial processes, consistency in quality control, and it was kind of the rave of the late 1990s. But to be honest with you, James, I, I kind of phased it out, you know, when I, when I came in because, you know, when I say the company was running out of ideas in the, in the 90s, that's kind of what I mean. And that, you know, Six Sigma is a, it's a methodology. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. But it's not going to, it wasn't going to help the company grow, right? It wasn't going to help us introduce new products. It wasn't going to help us get new countries. It wasn't going to help us attract the talent. And so I think when a little bit in the world is that some of these process tools, which had really powered the 80s and 90s, they're still relevant today, but they're not very differentiating today is what I would say. Yeah, and it's like transportation. Cross-country planes now are slower than they were in 1950. And part, a lot of that is due to regulation, but uh, I think it was Matt Ridley who um, just wrote a book on innovation that basically the first half of the 20th century was innovation in speed. And the second half was the innovation in ones and zeros. And GE is very much involved in speed, you know, whether it's aircraft or even, Mm -hmm. you know, drilling for the oil or whatever. I mean, why isn't every commercial plane like going at Mach 5 right now? Look, I think I think that there becomes bandwidths of innovation that you find yourself sticking inside of right and and if you're in big industries that are heavily regulated you you kind of get taught to swim in your lane uh I, I remember probably 2015 i was in arizona and i was on a panel with elon musk and i had met elon musk a few other times you know james look i have a pretty good technology story i, I could talk about big complicated products and those days we had a very strong digital initiative and things like that but Elon's talking about building rockets, building rockets at a third the cost that Boeing or Northrop Grumman and people like that could do it. And he just came at it from a completely different, you know, context of, of uh, he could raise an infinite amount of capital, he could hire the best, and he was willing to kind of go after industries that were, weren't even being formed. And I think to a certain extent, that's where legacy companies have to either find their own way into that or partner to get into that, or you're just going to be irrelevant in 10 or 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Like it's almost a cliche to say that big legacy companies can't make an Uber. And I bring up Uber because I know you were um, being thought of as to be a potential CEO of Uber. Why doesn't a GE or an IBM or whoever, why don't they make the next Uber or the next Google? They have the resources, they have the people. You say, you know, the company was running out of ideas, but how could you have kickstarted ideas at, at the employee level a little more? Yeah, no, I think, look, I think the, uh, I think the context that I would give you is that, you know, we tried a lot, we, we tried stuff and some of the stuff really worked, right? So we, we got into life sciences or we got into uh, a kind of embedded digital technologies. We got into renewable energy, wind and solar, things like that, that became a five or $10 billion industries 
almost de novo, right? So it's not that we can't do it. I think it's important. It's probably strategically important that they have um, some scalability or else big companies don't bring much strategic advantage. But, but I think increasingly, you know, James, there's got to be freedom to operate. And there also needs to be a currency. You know, in other words, you know, the G stock price or the GM stock price, or the IBM stock price is fine. But there needs to be a, a, also a currency that can attract uh, real entrepreneurs, real people that want to go for it. And, and that probably has to be done in more of a hybrid setting versus, you know, having everything be part of the mothership. Yeah. And, and, you know, as part of that, you know, you did do a lot of shedding of businesses. Uh, uh, I feel like you did a lot of things that Jack Welch wouldn't have done. Like, you know, for all I know, he wouldn't have gotten rid of NBC, but NBC always stood out to me as like, why is this in the GE company? And I, I sort of see there's an argument, which is like, Hey, it's not such a bad thing to, to help control part of the media particularly if your company touches every industry on the planet. But what was the reasoning of getting NBC and then divesting of it? You know, it's a funny story. So in the 1980s, media was one of the few businesses that couldn't be really attacked by Japanese competitors, right? And so when Welch was looking at kind of the way the 1980s was unfolding, he liked media because it was really a protected space, right? You, you were protected by the FCC, global companies couldn't own franchises, and it was kind of an under-competed industry. And he was right about that. In some ways, it was brilliant. And, you know, when I was saying earlier about acquisitions, in the case of NBC, it was extremely well run over the time that GE had it. We were number one for a lot of years. And then in the early 2000s, we acquired Universal, which was a great fit. But, you know, there wasn't one NBC meeting I ever went to where I could say, you know, that script sucked, right? Uh, <laughs> we, should, we should do another season of Friends or things like that. I could walk into an aviation review and I could uh, give lots of help or oil and gas or healthcare or, you know, you name it. But NBC really was a, it was a different team. It was a different context. It was a different pace. My belief actually was counter to what you said, which was it became increasingly, you know, in a, in a polarized world, it became more of a liability than an asset in terms of the ability to sell the other products in our portfolio. And then I, I always really had kind of like a context of you're in it to win it or you shouldn't be in it. And I remember when Bob Iger, who was a guy I respected a lot at Disney, when they bought Marvel for like five or six billion dollars. I had the team do an analysis of it. And I just said, you know, guys, we would never do this. I would never let you do this. Like, like, here's the guy I respect the most making a bold strategic move. And I look at it and say, that doesn't work for me. It's probably time to exit the business when, when you see other people making strategic moves that you wouldn't do. And that's kind of the way we thought about it. And, well, uh, and it's interesting you bring up those deals and Disney and you, and you mentioned this in, in the book about one of the things that influenced you about selling NBC was that you had no plans to take on a huge acquisition strategy like Disney and Disney buying Marvel, Pixar, Star Wars, even Star Wars for $2 billion, a franchise that already run its length. Those were such intelligent deals. Brilliant. Brilliant. No, we did Harry Potter. Look, the last year we owned it, we did Harry Potter for 800 million. You looked at it and said, this is so much money. You know, how could we ever do it? It was, it was brilliant, you know? And so, you know, I, I think we, we played, here's what I would say. We played our cards reasonably well. You know, we did Universal. We did, we did some big strategic moves. But in a conglomerate, you got to keep playing them over and over again. You, you got you to go wherever it takes you. And I kind of felt like, particularly during the financial crisis, we weren't going to be able to keep up. And, and rather than destroy value, it was probably a good time to exit the business. Yeah. I mean, during the financial crisis, I don't know all of your strategies during that. And you, you discussed this in, in the book, but obviously you could have bought every piece of bad debt out there with the idea that, you know, you, you kind of knew already the fed and the Congress were going to do these massive bailouts of the banking system. 
and basically bolster all of this bad debt. Plus there was the mark to market rule was going to undoubtedly get changed at some point. And you were probably inside these discussions. Wouldn't it have made sense to basically buy everything you could at that point? You know, what happened, uh, James was, you know, probably nobody got hurt worse with the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy than, than G Capital because we were kind of a wholesale funded finance company. So we were debt funded. We weren't deposit funded. And so, you know, we went from having a lower cost of capital to having a very high cost of capital, which severely kind of impaired our ability to maneuver in that context. We became a systemic institution with none of the benefits of banks, right? So we were on an island of one with kind of the worst of all worlds uh, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of how we were positioned. So we were really, we were bounded with respect to how flexible we can be. Now, all the things you just said, if you go back to the early 1990s with the savings and loan uh, recession and all that, that's when G Capital really exploded. That was when G Capital really turbocharged its growth because we did just exactly what you said. We got into commercial real estate, we bought assets cheap, you know, other people. But when the financial crisis, really the Fed made it so that large banks held all the cards. And in order for us to really maneuver the way we needed to, we probably needed to separate G Capital buy a bank or merge with a bank and kind of uh, march on into the future. Yeah, like the, like the Fed and the government were basically tucking, tucking companies like Merrill Lynch and so on underneath other banks and building these like super banks. Yeah. Since you were, you were relatively financially safe compared with some of these banks in trouble, couldn't you have offered your services as to be essentially a super bank and they would have sold, they would have tucked some of these banks under you, like maybe Bank of America would have gone under you. We would have had to be the one going under because we weren't a bank holding company and they were going to make us a bank holding company just mm -hmm. because without hiving off the industrial stuff, right? So, but I say in the book, you know, in the last chapter, I, I talk about five things I would have done differently. I, I don't think we played our cards in financial services as well as we could have, right? There, there were moments in time where maybe we could have gone to KKR, TPG, or one of the big private equity firms and kind of smudged it together with them and created kind of a, a freestanding finance company. You know, I'm not sure we got as much value as we could have out of the really good assets we had and, and pretty good team we had. Yeah, because that, that was definitely a pivotal moment. And, you know, you also say in, in terms of the things that you feel you could have done better, you say you wish you had said, I don't know more often, which I think is true for just about everyone. Like I, I've been on CNBC quite a bit. And one of the things you're always, you always get a sense is you're really not allowed to say, I don't know when you're on TV being asked your opinion. And even though that might be the correct answer and, and during this COVID crisis that I've had a bunch of epidemiologists on the podcast and the answers I really appreciate the most was when a top epidemiologist says, we just simply don't know about this, but like when, what were times where you really felt, I don't know, would have been the correct answer. Yeah, look, so I think particularly when you run a company with 300,000 people, it's hard to say I don't know, just because their lives kind of intersect with the decisions you're making. But I would say in, in the financial crisis, you know, there, there, were, there were times when I gave answers when, you know, you just didn't know enough about what six months, nine months, a year down the road would look like, right? What would the regulators do? How much capital would you have to have? It's it was hard to make commitments like I won't cut the dividend unless you knew what kind of financial structure you needed to have to maintain regulatory goodwill, let's say, with, with your regulator. And so those those were the things when, particularly in those times when I wish I just had said, you know, look, I, I just don't know what the dividend's going to be, right? We're just going to go through a year or two where we're just not, we're, we just don't know. And those those are the kinds of times when I wish I'd said it more. But then how would you have managed the psychology of both employees and Wall Street who, you know, they loathe, I don't know. Yeah, just, you know, what you have to do is you have to continue to communicate on the other things that you can control. So you've got to raise the communication, you know, let's say with investors, you say, look, I, I just don't know what the difference is going to be, but let me tell you about my aviation business again. Let me tell you about the power business again. Let me tell you, Here's how the G capital businesses are recovering. And you just have to try to give other data points that they can point to, you, you know, to make whatever investment decision they're going to make. But yeah, no, look, it's, 
it's tough, but I definitely, I definitely would say it's one of the things I wish I had done differently for sure. Yeah. It's such an interesting thing because I think an entire business strategy revolves around being able to say, I don't know. I mean, that, that allow, it almost creates a certain vulnerability that if you could, if you could pull it off, they'll trust you even more down the line. Yeah, I mean, you look at Warren. You look at you look at Buffett. Really, uh, Warren has made a living out of not giving guidance. You know, kind of saying, "Look, here's my here's my shareholder letter. You're either with me or don't invest." Right, and and Jeff Bezos has done the same thing. So I, I think some really great people have not tried to give certainty where no certainty could be given. But you know, a lot of people get fired thinking they're Warren Buffett and Jeff Bezos as well. You know? so, so it's kind of like a hard, it's a hard path to walk. Well, that's an interesting point. What, what's an example of someone getting fired who tries a little too hard to be like Warren Buffett? I just know that like he's earned over 70 years and Jeff over 30 years. They've earned credibility that uh, somebody in their first year has a hard time, you know, maybe having enough self-confidence to take it on. All that being said, you know, I go back and say, you know, maybe right after 9-11, just recasting the company would, would have, might have been the best thing I could have ever done. I feel like that's a little bit, not quite imaginary thinking, but you were, just think of the stress you were under. Not only was it 9-11, but you had just started. Yeah, there are a lot of reasons not to. Don't, don't get me wrong. Yeah. There are a ton of reasons not to. And one of the comments I make in the book and all the interviews I'm doing is, look, you can only live life forward. You know, what I wanted to do in the book was tell stories about decisions. And I'd like, I, I want the reader to kind of sit there and not like, not like second guess me the way everybody else does, but sit there and say, you know, like, okay, if I were there on, in January of 2002, would I have reset the company or would I have just said, okay, guys, let's talk to the engine room. Let's keep going, you know, so yeah. let's, let's keep going. So that's the way the book is written. And then, you know, another thing you mentioned is something you would wish maybe you, you hadn't done as much of was particularly towards the end of your reign as CEO, you took on, you know, new acquisitions, new projects. Do you think you were kind of wishing for even higher relevance. So taking on these last projects that would turn out to be great. You know, I didn't feel that way at the time, but I think that's a fair question. You know, I, I don't think that was in my heart, but that, that was a fair question, but there was a, it was a lot for the board to manage, right? It, a couple of big deals, uh, you know, kind of exiting G capital, uh, CEO succession, uh, you know, just, there was just a lot going on at, at the end. And, and, and I, you know, unlike I'd say when, when I took over from Jack, there was really nothing going on. <laughs> in other words, you know, the, the, the company was cruising, uh, the world was at peace, you know, the U S economy was strong. Uh, there was really n nothing but tailwind. You know, when I retired, there was nothing but choppy seas and lightning and headwind. So what, what would you like in this COVID period right now, what, what do you see happening with the economy and what would you have done if you were CEO now? Like, and, and, and when I ask about the economy, I mean, basically forgetting the fact that there was a pandemic for a second, we just basically shut a good chunk of the economy down for almost a year yeah. now. And if you had done that without a reason, if, if, if for some reason the U S said, let's just take a vacation for a year, everyone would have said the economy is going to go to zero and what is happening. Cause I think it's still kind of not, um, you know, it is still a fog around it. And, and what would you do right now, given? Yeah, no, no, that's a great have? question. You know, and it's, it's really interesting trying to think back a year because some stuff is obvious, like hotels, we're going to have a tough time. Some stuff you would know instinctively, but it's been more, it's certainly been higher than you thought, which is the whole world going to e-commerce, you know, digital platforms doing well. So I put those kind of in the, more obvious, you know, what's, what's been less obvious, you know, the automotive business has been screaming. Uh, the appliance business has been very strong because people drive cars. They don't fly. People stay home. They don't go to the office. Right? So if you, if you think back a year from now and you said, shit, I'm going to put money in GM or something like that, you would have made a lot of, you know, you would have made a fair amount of money over the last year. And those weren't obvious. So when we sit here now, I look and say there's still sectors 
that are beaten up that I think are actually gonna uh, gonna rock when when the country opens up. Everything in the aviation and airline supply chain. I just think once people get vaccinated and some of the the stricter rules get out of the system, people are gonna go back on planes. They're gonna they're gonna go back on trains. They're gonna travel. They're gonna they're gonna take advantage of freedom and they're gonna go see people and meet people and they're gonna go global flying. So I think the airline industry is still beaten up. And I think that's a place, you know, as I, as I think about myself now as an investor, where I would allocate capital, I, I think there's places that are beaten up that are going to stay beaten up like commercial real estate that, that I just don't think, you know, Manhattan real estate or San Francisco real estate is going to be as valuable as it was two years ago for a decade or maybe more, maybe never. Right. So, so that's kind of how I would think about how the world opens up. What other industries do you do you think are beaten up that that might make a comeback? I think, like I said, everything around transportation, maybe hospitality. I think I think there might be good opportunities in hospitality. There might be good opportunities in gaming. Uh, I think retailing, you know, kind of physical retailing has gotten crushed. I think that there may be a, a little bit of a bounce in some of those because again, I just think this notion that people don't want to see people is just wrong. It's just, uh, it's just wrong. And I, you know, I go back, uh, uh, you know, James, like during after 9-11 and SARS, you could have bought everything in the aviation supply chain for 10 cents on the dollar. And you would have made so much money if you had done that. And, and if you sat back and thought about it, you would have really done it. The other thing quite interesting that, you know, there's US and China are in such a crappy position right now, you know, in terms of the two countries and how they interact. But on the ground, China is very robust and there are places for U.S. companies to invest in China or U.S. investors to invest in China that are really, really lucrative, like the healthcare sector in China. I'd be making bets in China right now as well, just because if, if you sit in New York City and all you did is watch CNBC and, and read the Wall Street Journal, you would say, okay, you know, like we're gonna go to war uh, with China in two months, right? We're gonna, the planes are gonna take off and the aircraft carriers, that's not gonna happen, right? China China's a parallel economy that's very robust and there's still places for American companies to invest. Yeah, and and uh, what do you see like, you know, five years from now, What what, what, what do things look like? What are the top trending industries even after things come back? Oh gosh. So I, I look at trends a lot. Uh, yeah, know. no, no. I, I, I give you two that I, that I really, you know, and I'm not sure these are going to be super aha, but you know, a lot of places around healthcare services, how people get healthcare delivered doors have been open during COVID that are going to fly open. I think is, is, um, as the world recovers. And I'm one of these people that thinks that healthcare is going to be a third of the US GDP in 10 or 20 years. I, I think there's no stopping healthcare just continuing its march towards being a bigger and bigger part of the US economy. So I, I love the trends about taking new technologies and embedding them in healthcare delivery, whether it's you know embedding uh, artificial intelligence into how bills take place or how insurance takes place or value-based care or, you know, supporting radiology with artificial intelligence, things like that. That's, that's huge. And then the other industry I like a lot is one that's going to decouple supply chains and allow uh, companies to make countries in a country for a country. So versus shipping things around the world, I think doing things like additive manufacturing, distributed manufacturing, more local manufacturing. I think that's going to happen as well. So those are two. I, those are two I like a lot. I, I, your example of radiology is very interesting because right now a doctor, it, it by law, an actual radiologist has to give the summary of the X-ray. But AI can actually do a better. It, it turns out a lot of research has shown AI can do a better analysis of like X-ray scans, for instance. But by law, the the radiologist has to be the one to deliver the news. Is there potential for like, how do you deal with the fact that AI, um, will eventually do enough to supplant jobs, if not for laws, like how do you kind of make those transitions? You know, it, it comes, it comes in, 
you know, step by step. So the first AI tools were going to be, um, you know, kind of making radiologists more effective, you know, using machine learning and using, uh, you know, kind of pattern recognition to make radiologists more effective. And then I just think you're going to go step by step. So when uh, AI does some of the procedures like, like mammography, which is very kind of repetitive, uh, and there's a lot of misreads by ra human radiologists, you know, you're going to see more tools that actually e eat into what radiologists do. And then I, I think, James, look, I, I had my... Um, I had my prostate out two years ago and you had a choice to either have a surgeon do it or having a robot do it. Right. So, you know, and I did research, I did research on both and I ended up having the physician do it. Right. It was a close call for me because I had two friends that used robotics and they were screaming at me, but I said, you know, I just want to see the smiling face of the doctor. <laughs> you know, I, I know I mean, call me old fashioned, but, you know, that's the way technology works. It doesn't happen all at once, but then you you look back over five or 10 years and more of it's happened. And I think that's that's where technology can go in healthcare. You forgot to mention you watched Terminator eight times in a row before your surgery. <laughs> so you got a little nervous that Arnold Schwarzenegger would be doing the surgery. <laughs> you know? That's that too. Yeah, um, I, did you ever get burnt out during your 16 years at GE? I mean, there was so many ups and downs and complications and people yelling at you for various yeah, reasons. Yeah, you know, it was, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a kind of like a show up guy, you know? So I, I, um, I always tell my students on the last day of class, I say successful careers answer three questions, right? One is how fast you can learn because the world is really changing and right. believe it or not, even when you're at Harvard or Stanford, you're never as dumb as today, right? You're, you're, you're the dumbest you'll ever be right now. So you better keep learning. Two is how much can you give? How much can you give to others? How much are you willing to invest in other people? And the third one is how much can you take, right? How much, how many times can you get hit in the head with a stick and still keep coming? And what I found out, James, is that I could take a lot, that, that I actually could take a lot and that, and that I always, I never lost my curiosity. I never lost my passion. I had to sometimes change my workflow so I could be doing more things that re would rejuvenate me. But I found in my career that I could take a lot. When you say, how much can you give? Some people might interpret that just financially or. No, I mean, emotionally, I mean, coaching others. I mean, helping others, taking the time to be a good manager, taking the time to be a good teammate, taking the time to go the extra mile for the people you work with. And yeah. You know, to be honest with you, like, like, you know, I did 100,000 performance reviews, right? Here's your strengths. Here's your weaknesses. Here's what you can do next. I did this for my whole life, right? But you find out people fail for not like, you know, sometimes people say, well, you, you, you just didn't do that meeting that well, or you should have made this or stuff like that. People fail because they're not smart enough or they're selfish, you know, they, they fail for very human uh, reasons. And there's a lot of people out there that are just selfish, that, that are just like, you know, it's all about them. And when I say, how much can you give? It's about being unselfish. It's about being willing to kind of give of yourself and give to others. Well, this is, this is really powerful advice. And, you know, you say part of success is luck, but there's also that cliche luck favors the prepared and perhaps all these things, like what you said earlier, you know, see people when you don't need them. That's kind of a way to prepare that luck. Totally. No, no, look, I'd say that's one of the best ways to prepare that luck is to do things when no one's looking, to do things when there's not an immediate return, whether it's investing in a product or making a new relationship. Those are the things that help you be prepared, you know, when bad days happen. And then I, and, and, and Jeff Imald, thank you so much for your time. I know you're super busy and, and the book just came out, but I have one more question, which I'm, I'm just personally curious about, you know, a lot about a lot of things you're successful. You know how to organize groups, teams, and actually make things. If you were transported a thousand years ago and you're but with all, you know, you're from the future and you're in like 1100 AD, how would you, what would you do? to show that you're better than everyone else. <laughs> like, I can't think of anything I would do to actually sit, do something amazing because I'm from the future. 
Look, I think I think the um, this is going to sound really trivial to your listeners. Maybe not. But collecting the best people, probably even in 1100, you know, 1100 AD, was probably the best thing you could do, right? And and so I think um, no matter what shitstorm I was in, when I was around people I trusted who were talented, it was okay. I made it through. And when I was around people that were less talented that I didn't trust, every problem was magnified. So I think uh, I think it's a talent collection game, even in all generations. That's great. I have not had that answer yet. That's a good one. Jeff Ilmelt, I really think this is one of the best CEO biographies I've ever read. It really is like a masterclass in being a CEO. So it's called Hot Seat. What I learned leading a great American company, Jeff Immelt, even the subtitle is, I feel very humble, like what I learned. Thank you uh, once again for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And you really do have an amazing, I could feel it. You have this amazing skill of bonding with people super fast. So I, I appreciate that as well. Not everyone has that. Thanks, James. I enjoyed it. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home.